Welcome to the exhibition opening and book launch for Atlas of the Material Worlds, mapping the agency of matter. Some people are excited, at least, at least one person. Um, I, I do want to start off by giving a, a thanks to um, Isla Berman for her, her support, as well as the, the current Dean, uh, Milo Hudson. Um, also, Sneha Patel in the communications team, Eric Field, IT team, Dick Smith, facilities team. Um, it's, it's, it's been a group effort. And, and a, definitely a hearty thanks to the student research assistants um, who have really helped over the years um, with this project. Um, Chloe Negraj, who may or may not be here, I think she might be coming. Um, Gail Gorm, uh, Gormelon, Tian Wang, Theodore Teichman, Alec Demott, Vita Shen, and Lita Collar. And a special thanks to Fanka Su uh, for helping with the uh, AR exhibition, Augmented Reality exhibition, which I'll explain momentarily. She also helped uh, briefly in, in the end of uh, compiling the index, which I know is not a, a fun task. Um, it's been five or six years really since the, the book idea um, sort of came to be and really three plus years uh, since kind of uh, working on it um, in, in earnest, essentially since I arrived here at UVA the fall of 2018. Hello, Lena. <laughs> um, and so the intention is to kind of keep things uh, short uh, this evening, um, really in, in, in the spirit of kind of storytelling, which the, the book kind of exercises. Uh, we'll have, um, in, in kind of taking a page from the, the English department and kind of creative writing discipline, we'll have some uh, readings uh, uh, from select excerpts from the chapters um, that include not only obviously myself, but some of the other ca uh, chapter uh, contributors, such as Brian Davis, uh, here at uh, UVA in, in the Landscape Architecture Department. And then Elizabeth Anoff, who's uh, running late, should be here momentarily. Um, also is a chapter contributor and assistant professor of technology, culture, and society at uh, New York University. And, and then we'll be transitioning into um, um, a, a sort of brief discussion before kind of opening it up to uh, questions. And we have Cassandra Frazier from the Chemistry Department with also affiliation with the School of Architecture here who will be uh, moderating that. Um, am I forgetting anything? We're hoping just to wrap this up in under an hour so we can make it to the exhibition and um, we'll also be selling uh, the book at a, at a pretty significant uh, discount. Um, there, the exhibition is Augmented Reality Enhanced. For those who may or, know, may or may not know what that is, you can download a free app on your phone. There's QR codes um, in the gallery signage. Um, and then you use your phone and the camera to sort of trigger these augmented reality visualizations. There's sort of a demo on, on the screen outside the gallery, but we'll have a, a couple uh, tablets as well there for uh, a demonstration. It allows you a little bigger screen than, than your phone. Um, so I'm going to start things off with a, a reading from the introduction that really sort of sets the scene for the project uh, before kind of taking a, a step back and um, sort of contextualizing the, the book's aspirations. Um, and before turning it over to, to Brian and, and Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> so again, this, this first part is you know, meant to be uh, a sort of narrative. So I, I do have some eye candy for those of you who can't um, do without that, but you're also welcome to sit back and relax, close your eyes and, and enjoy the story. Smooth, a trace of the vegetal. An undeniable mineral, salty percolation, too. With a translucent pearl hue and a sprig of thyme gracing its rim, I savor the creation. It's not as ornamental as my companions across the table, held in a bespoke ceramic vessel and topped with a tuft of jet black seaweed, but its visual minimalism closed layers of sensory revelation, realized best through tongue and nose. When sipped, the weight belies its ghostly appearance. A strange blend of lithic heaviness and rarefied thinness intimates its high altitude origins. Perhaps a synesthetic projection, yes, but its crater likely had just this in mind. Peruvian chef Rogelio Martinez Velez is known for guiding his patrons through space. From beneath the, the crashing waves of the Pacific Ocean, up and over the, the great continental divide of the Andes, and down again into the humid tropics of the Amazon jungle, never leaving their seat at the dining table. His plates are built around ecosystems, drawing on site-specific species of plants and animals, often incorporating indigenous cultural practices to create gastronomical portals into other worlds. His cocktails are no different, 
In fact, the drink I'm so enamored by was built around a mineral from the only family of rocks eaten by humans, salt. But not just any salt. This was salt from Las Salineras de Maras, or the salt pans of Maras, in Peru's sacred valley between Cusco and Machu Picchu. A sip from this coupe transports, transports one over 300 miles and up about 10,000 feet in elevation. Dating back to pre incan times, the salt pans of Maras are like a vast community garden carved in the valley's steep shoulders. But instead of squash and sunflowers, families and individuals farm sodium chloride in designated plots. It's quite the striking landscape to encounter. Most visitors hail a car from the nearby town, entering the valley from above. My pilgrimage, however, whistle having been wet in days earlier in Mima, had me hike in on foot from below. A brisk 30 minute ascent from the Urubamba River, snaking upwards between arid mountain folds, eventually reveals a stark white mass rising above the trail's horizon as the veritable goat path bends back against the cliff. Several minutes further, the gleaming mass grows and unfolds into an intricately sculpted painter's palette. Around 5,000 shallow ponds caked in white crystals bleed with ochres, umbers, roses, and rusts, beautifully terraced along the valley's contours. Each step gives a satisfying crunch as one finally steps into the network of paths and pans, runnels and channels, some carved into the soil, others fashioned with overlapping ceramic shingles, verbal pass and direct salty brine from a nearby spring into the sepia-hued wells. The fruiting font of a process millions of years in the making, the spring eventually merged as tectonic plates shifted, first impounding part of an ocean into a lake, then burying the lake's salt deposit deep, deep beneath a mountain, only to be slowly dissolved and brought to the surface by a subterranean stream. When a pool fills with this primeval solution, its earthen walls and floor muscled into shape by hand, yet still abiding by the valley's form, the runnel is plugged, its flow continuing down to other pools or draining into the valley below. The brine, up to two inches in depth, then rests under the sun's heat. After a few days of evaporation, the sodium and chlorine ions, having been dissolved by the water's polarization, bond and crystallize into flakes, the flakes into geometric shards, and the shards eventually into a sedimented crust precipitated along the bottom of the pool. The process is repeated until three to four inches of salt accrues. Salineros, or salt miners, scrape this into mounds with flat rakes, shoveling them with baskets into greater, greater mounds in adjacent dry plots to drain further, then port their harvest to storage sheds and eventually funneling or funnel the glistening grains, a spectrum from white to pink to brown based on the fluctuating minerality of the brine pools. Into bags to be loaded on trucks and sold throughout Peru and neighboring regions, and online through Amazon, of course. Each earthen pool, no more than a foot deep and roughly the size of a single car garage floor, produces an average of about 400 pounds of salt per month during the dry season. Possibly continuing a communal governance similar to the Incans, the pools are designated by the people of neighboring towns, Maras and Pinchingoto, to local families for production. The number of pools <clears throat> and location determined by family size and seniority. Pools are inherited by children from their parents, with many working their wells from an early age into late life, just as their parents, grandparents, and Incan ancestors did before them. In fact, legend has it, this all began with I.R. Chachi, one of the four siblings believed to have founded the Incan Empire. After being trapped by his brothers and sisters in a cave, jealous and fearful of his power, Chachi wept salty tears, tears that continued to emerge from the ground to feed the salt pans. I can't help but think I consumed a few tears in my cocktail back in Lima, an unsubtle, unsubtle metaphor for modern tourism's infiltration of indigenous Peru in a modern century legacy, or I should say a multi-century legacy of Western exploitation. So this convergence of colonization, governance, mythology, economy, transportation, landform making, familial enterprise, solar evaporation, salt crystallization, tectonics, material aesthetics, tourism, all the way to Michelin starred astronomy hundreds of miles away with cocktail in hand revolves around a rock, is animated by it. The seemingly innocuous inanimate material, a simple one-to-one -one mineral compound of sodium and chlorine, quite prevalent around the world, dissolved in oceans and buried in mountains, catalyzes a vibrant web of dynamics and relationships across all areas of human life and beyond. Salt is more than just sodium, chlorine, and its useful marriage, but also cultures, economies, and ecologies. But we seldom think of this liveliness, salt as an actor, 
an agent, an expression, and interaction. With such influence, it seems inadequate to relegate it to the impotent terms that are traditionally paired with such a material, inanimate, inert, but lifeless. Salt has played a leading role in everything from the Union winning the American Civil War, the salt famine, to serving as insurance against energy crises, the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve, storing over 600 million barrels of crude oil in subterranean salt domes along the Gulf Coast, to housing the largest lithium reserve in the world, Bolivia's Salt Solardo Uni, to winter road de-icing across the globe, to a plethora of industrial uses, to various culturally significant salt harvesting operations similar to the salt pans in Maras, such as the elevated structures of the Añana Salt Valley in Spain, or the camel-led com uh, commutes to the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia. From there, salt wages its own subtle battles against other materials, systems, and human constructs. From salt corrosion of vehicles in northern climates to the salinization of agricultural fields in the Araro Sea Basin of Central Asia, to saltwater intrusion and the loss of land in South Louisiana. Labeling a material like salt inanimate paints a misleading picture. Might we be missing something in how we conceive of and live with the non-living? I think Elizabeth Anoff has, has joined us. So welcome to have a, a seat with the, the rest of the panel. Give you a little, little segue. So I wanted to give a, a bit sort of a contextualization um, of the larger uh, book project as I grab a, a sip of water as well and change PDFs. So the story of salt in Peru, with its far-reaching connections and constructions, is a, is a mere aperitif for what follows in the book. So for the kinds of questions that the book um, sort of attempts to energize. So what role do non-living materials play in our lives? Might a closer examination of those roles reveal an undeniable agency we have often overlooked or disregarded? And if so, does this material agency change our understanding of the social structures, ecologies, economies, cosmologies, um, and the landscapes that surround us? And perhaps most importantly, why does this matter? How might this knowledge and outlook empower us? So by asking abnormal questions about very normal materials, we enter in complex networks of relations across varied scales of time and space. And so it's composed in an, of, as an atlas, the chapters of this book uh, thus accustom the reader to kind of uh, uh, uncharted territories and times, um, or I should say uncommonly charted territories and times. It's an ont ontological attunement of sorts. The agenda is a metaphysical repositioning of the physical, particularly the inanimate matter of elements and elemental materials as equal agents of power. And the purpose is to catalyze a more productive and ultimately richer way of approaching the world than current neoliberalism or even noble environmentalism as we accelerate into the global climate crisis. So this is a, is a project where material is understood as a type of kin that runs through us, composes us, directs us as much as exert ourselves upon it and its source landscapes. So this kinship is achieved by rendering the agency of non-living materials through an unusual leveling of subjects, objects, and environments into their respective elemental material, materiality. And a new sensitivity and engagement, or a new practice, you might say, with a world increasingly in social, ecological, and cognitive crisis is thus set into motion. Put simply, this book dares readers to see the world anew, from material up. And so the subtle yet paradigmatic recalibration of political ecology from a new materials lens is achieved with attention to aesthetics and entertainment through a proposed genre that I'm calling onto-cartography uh, or onto-cartographic stories. So fusing ontology, the study of being, uh, by calling on metaphysics of the relational nature behind all things, and then cartography, the science um, or practice of map making, by calling on sort of the world building and wayfinding powers of mapping, with the narrative arc uh, and the emotive power of the story, this nascent genre of ontocartography attempts to render an ideological flat view of the world, a flatness where human, fungi, mineral thing perform upon an equal playing field, where all forces and flows are or can become lively, affecting, and signaling, as Jane Bennett has said, often as grouped networks, assemblages, or ecologies of actors. Ontocartographic uh, protagonists are often not human, often not even living, but rather mineral, chemical, elemental. The stories are almost always telescopic, scalar, 
The characters or materials in this case require understanding as both the irreducible matter from which they come to the larger planetary multi, multi-actor assemblages and ecologies w- within which they live. This understanding of the nature of being, a way of seeing the world, a weaving of new materialism, act, actor network theory, nature cultural entanglement, and transcorporeality, to employ the argot of academia explored in, 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 in the chapters, with an underscored uh, focus on non-living material, is at the heart of the practical sensibility attempting to be cultivated within the pages of the book. And it's not intuitive, it's not effortless um, for the reader or for the writer for that matter to uh, approach the world in such a way as we are really up against a few millennia of human-centered thought of a human-commanded hierarchy of agency. And moreover, how can a story written by and in the language of humans successfully achieve such a position of worldly flatness or, or sort of material equality? It appears futile by ne- definition. And there are a few strategies in response to this, such as illustrating the alien hybridity of human bodies with respect to the plethora of microorganismic communities supporting their health and physiology, or I should say our health and physiology, that insofar as anything acts at all, it has already acted or entered an agenic assemblage uh, with a multitude of bacterial consortia. But in truth, a story is a medium of communication and thus necessarily requires species-specific uh, symbols and uh, syntax. Still, the ontocartographic story is, is a unique undertaking, um, attempting to capture something inherently resistant to representation. This, again, the sort of idea of flat ontology or worldview of all matter. And for that reason, that the book embraces uh, a collagic technique um, of word and image, synthesizing uh, quantitative analysis, qualitative representation, and radical cartography. So chapters of the book weave a story read as much through language as through its uh, uh, mappings, co-constructing the, the narrative. And the chapters also require a, a loosening or sort of a dislodging of readers' normative perceptions of space, time, and agency. So this is both sort of preparatory advice for the reader as well as sort of desired result. And as illustrated in Maras Peru, salt is multitudes more than a tasty rock supporting gastronomical inventions. Salt is elemental. Sodium and chlorine, whose atoms packed tightly together in a cube to form crystals of halite, or salt, were, uh, were sedimented and buried by geological forces at the scale of tectonic plates in millions of years, well before humans were even humans. Salt figures into the genesis of a people, bridging man and land, a way of life and identity. Salt expresses itself as an undeniable force, challenging human-centered and designed worlds, Salt makes worlds, too, in lively participation with other living and non-living actors. So vast scales of time, space, and agency such as this are navigated in, in the book, and as you'll, you'll hear in, in, in some of the chapter readings uh, this evening, um, it, it really challenges the reader's projective flex, flexibility and imaginary prowess. Um, space is from the sub- subatomic to the galactic. Periods of time from the instant to the astrogeological are traversed. And a material guide accompanies uh, the reader, part human voice, part materialist expression, part wayfinding cartography, entangled in composition. And although the authors of this volume mostly come from the practice and research of, of landscape architecture, um, that we're sort of taking a step uh, away from that with at least one of our speakers this evening, um, when, I, when I pose the question, what might this knowledge and outlook afford us? This us is equally the des- designer reading a site in its context um, or specking source materials for a project, as it is the sort of quotidian consumer shopping for the latest iPhone or driving through the fracking fields of North Dakota on their way to the, the county fair. And so landscape architecture is a particularly versatile lens through which to study such multiscalar and, and complicated dynamics, as it is inherently interdisciplinary, navigating the social justice issues of public space, socio-ecological issues of ecosystem performance and interface, the space-making and engineering of architecture, the horticulture of the garden, the economics and logistics of infrastructure, all the way to the demystification of those far-off landscapes of of extraction, seldom seen and rarely considered. So thus, the the book really holds this uh, irreverence for binary categorization um, in pursuit of empowering a a readership of, of all designers of the built environment including those untrained in the design professions. And so as will be discussed with uh, uh, Brian and Elizabeth, the selected materials composing 
the atlas guide one through a diverse collection of, of nature cultural entanglements <clears throat> from the recreation of uh, across florida's beaches which we won't hear about this evening uh, to the lithium mining in, in chile uh, fueling the world's green energy transition which i might be able to speak to and, and some questions afterwards but in investigating these domains of life human and non-human through on ontocartographic stories really affords a new way of seeing knowing and thus acting in a complex world and i consider it the, the proffering of a new power thank you brian do you want to start us off and then we'll continue with elizabeth i have the images from your chapter you're welcome to stand up here well actually maybe you should stand up here because the microphone is okay is the computer I should say that all these images are from Matthew and Fonka and many of the other. They're not my images. I can't take credit for any of uh, what you you would see. Um, so my chapter is about mud, and uh, the, the title is Mud and Its Meaning in a Port Town. I had been working in Baltimore in the Chesapeake Bay for a couple years when uh, Matthew approached me with this idea. And um, while his... I idea for the book, I think, is elevated, sort of interested in the ethical, ethical dimensions of things beyond the human. Um, I'm not sure that my chapter rises to that level. Um, it's more just based in some observations about mud, but um, I was appreciative to have the opportunity to uh, write them down. Okay, I do, uh, I'm just going to read a couple little excerpts from the middle and then the last few paragraphs. Um, in the middle, uh, it starts with a heading that says, where does it go? Where does the mud go in Baltimore? And I started it with a quote from Emmanuel Levinas' uh, Totality and Infinity. It says, a thing exists in the midst of its waste. It says, or I say, there are modern monuments all around Baltimore. For the last 50 years, a system of landforms called dredge material containment facilities have been created to house the mud dredged from the harbor. Greater in scale than the famous system of forts that protected the harbor in the early years of the Republic, these monoliths are scattered around, designed to hold tens of millions of cubic yards of mud in perpetuity. Created through a process of dredging, inflowing, dewatering, testing, trenching, and finally discharging the clear water after it is chemically verified as clean, the mud is compacted into high trapezoids behind protective dikes that promise future port terminals or land haphazardly reclaimed as upland habitat. These landscapes are monuments hiding in plain sight. Yes, they are a technical solution to the regulatory problems posed by the need to dredge and warehouse the mud, but the DMCFs are also cultural landscapes whose simple geometric forms are evidence of ingenuity, the evolution of environmental protection, the necessity of maritime shipping, and the physical fact of mud in a port town the physical fact of mud in a port town and the cultural desire to make it go away. So that was a running theme through the chapter that we have traditionally wanted the mud to go away. Open to receive sediment in 1984 after 14 years of construction and lawsuits, Hartmiller Island is a low trapezoid of mud, one of these DMCFs, rising out of the bay. 44 feet high and over a thousand acres in area, Locusts and poplars growing out of the armor sides, covered with three-foot diameter armor stone and riprap. What a wild idea. It wasn't a bad one. The Clean Water Act and state laws of the 1960s prohibited the discharge of pollution in state and federal waters. Because ports tended to cluster dirty manufacturing industries, and the clays would bind to or mix with many of their byproducts, such as petrochemical compounds, heavy metals, the mud was really dirty that they were dredging. Additionally, the agricultural runoff that brought phosphorus and clay to the bay was producing algal blooms that were impairing the bountiful fish and mollusk populations, thus Hartmiller Island. These dredge material containment facilities were honest, if not smart. They would contain the stuff, looking and acting almost like a modern-day landfill. About, a million, about 100 million cubic yards now sit there. If you stacked it vertically on a football field, it would rise for about 11 miles. For 30 years, the port put its mud there until the facility closed in 2005. On top of Hartmiller Island, 
On top of Hart Miller, the island is as flat as a pancake with no perceptible variation in the topography, though you wouldn't know it at first glance because the Phragmites is eight feet tall and thicker than a cornfield. The western 300 acres is a little bit different, lower with a pool and some wetland areas. It is the south cell and it was filled and remediated first. At the far eastern end of this inelegant lozenge-shaped island, there is a pool which is evidence of a bit of great difference after all. The pool grows and shrinks with the seasons and it's the bane of the operators that are charged with maintaining the place. Originally, they had intended to simply discharge all this water and then call it a state park, allowing the port to wash their hands of it and move on. Uh, but for that mud, you see the marine sediments, once they sit up in the air like this, the salts oxidize and produce a highly acidic residue. The soil pH ranges from three to 3.8 in most places. And any, so any water that runs over, it's far too acidic to discharge into the Chesapeake Bay under state law. It's almost as if the mud is protesting. You shouldn't have made me into a mountain. I shouldn't be like this. So I'm gonna skip in just to the kind of end part now called Art in the Age of Islands. Places like the Reserva Ecologica or Hart Miller or Poplar Island are uncanny, strange yet familiar, conjuring trepida trepidation and revulsion through allure. They have island-like characteristics, what with being in the middle of the water, attracting birds and plants and fishes and amphibians. I'm always tempted to see them through a critical lens. Quote, you are not an island so much as a monument to our hubris, enabled by techno-scientific knowledge and fossil-fueled power. You were made for a purpose to solve the problem of where to put all the mud. And that is all true. It would be nice to leave it there, self-satisfied, but for that mud. Like most solutions outside of the abstracted confines of math books, the mud, the mud islands have spawned new problems. The mud persists as this kind of obstinate material, one that seems to insist on the fact that magic does indeed exist in the world. How do you predict the migration of marshes, the protection needed from the next hurricane? How do you describe and model the movement of mud in a nearshore system? Why do these huge monument islands even exist? No one really knows the answers to these questions, though it would be valuable if we did. And we've tried to figure out the answers. But, but the mud reminds us that the world is far weirder than we usually give it credit for, at least in our professional roles. The mud remains autonomous and irreducible, existing beyond our policies and tools and best intentions. Heraclitus was right, nature loves to hide. The age of islands is probably ending. We won't build many more of the huge containment facilities in the water in the future. Hart Miller and her cousins are going out of style. They will stand as monuments to a time when we valued our coastal landscapes, but didn't realize how important and valuable mud was and did wild things to them both. Now the islands are expensive and the sediment is cleaner. And yet there are things we might still do with the problem of mud, even if we can't solve it. As the islands fill up, we'll figure out smarter ways to shape their boundaries. We need good cheap ways to create undulating topography on the top and healthy soil with the sediment on site during the placement process. So we don't have to truck it in from somewhere else, strip mining another healthy landscape to restore a scar. And the edges where these island things meet the water could be better. Yes, they could provide habitat and such, but much more intriguing to me is how to make them habitable. We don't absolve our sins by making everything for the birds, so we might as well make a few of them into the monuments that they are. Have you ever walked on the armor stone edge of a containment facility in the summer, all jagged boulders and goldenrod and thistle? What a riot, moving even, also quite dangerous. Designers could make it a bit less so and in just the right way that honors the strangeness of these ziggurats. Perhaps more important, we need that sediment for other things and are figuring out how to use it. Bay bottom crab habitat and oyster restoration, wetland creation, carbon sinks, wave attenuation, shoreline risk reduction, storm surge protection. These practices are critical now and have to be scaled up and the mud will have a role in it. In our modern way, we accidentally created monuments in one place as a neatly partitioned and knowable solution to a problem in another. In the future, the Chesapeake Bay and estuaries and river mouths up and down the coast themselves will be the monuments. Far subtler and more vast than any of these islands, a place where habitability multiplies even in the risk of loss and overwhelming uncanny beauty. If we take mud for granted until now, 
is only because it is so fundamental, so basic, that we cannot imagine our favorite places without it. That's it. Last but not least, Elizabeth Anoff. Let's see. The building is alive. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hennoff, um, and I'm a computational biologist by training. And so in my discipline, we really like to think about um, living organisms as like the actors and heroes that have agency in the world. And so kind of being tasked with talking about material agency was was quite a challenge, but I found it really interesting to kind of find the interstices in which we can talk about how living organisms relate to materials and how materials relate to living organisms. And so the material that I would like to share a few excerpts about is, um, is a metabolite. So a metabolite is a molecule or inert material that has been somehow processed by a living organism. Uh, so I have just a few excerpts prepared through, for, from the chapter. Okay. Um, sampling expedition. The Tyvek hazmat suit crinkles, and I'm awkwardly stomping in rubber boots five sizes too big. The rest of the team and I are on a different mission than the perambulating moms headed to Whole Foods or the lithe climbers coming from Brooklyn boulders. We're here on a hunt for microorganisms in the sludge and the stories they hold within. Our team, comprised of two landscape designers, of which one Matthew, a biotechnology entrepreneur, and me, the bioinformatician, make our way down to the Gowanus Canal shore. You can only access the canal from a few points. Most of its perimeter is guarded by the chain link and barbed wire of the manufacturing sites abutting the bulwarks that frame the body of water. These embankments have drawn the once flowing path of the creek into a tightly engineered canal. We splash our borrowed canoes into the water, settling into them in the rhythm of rowing. We have a hopeful map locating the 14 different locations we plan to stop and take sediments from the bottom of the canal. Our team's, extraction, our team's act of extraction was just the most recent in the history of the Gowanus area. With human settlement documented as early as 12,500 years ago, at the time of European contact, the area was inhabited by the Leni Lenape group of Algonquin people, also known as the Delaware, the local members of this once widespread population speak a dialect known as Munsee. The body of water named Gawain's Creek was turned into a canal in 1853 by dredging and widening its course and shoring its banks. Under the weight of the city's thrusting angles, it became the Gowanus Canal serving as transport for goods and materials through Gowanus Bay to the Hudson and the Atlantic, it also functioned as a dump site for waste generated by the industries alongside it. The environmental history of the canal today is emblematic of many post-industrial Superfund sites across the country. These sites were once important spaces for production and manufacturing that have since changed locations, leaving behind them a material, economic, and social legacy of toxicity. Our DNA analysis of the canal sediment samples shows that the metabolism of the microbial community includes some interesting bioremediation activity. For instance, the sediment microbiome degrades cresol, a petrochemical byproduct, toluene, an industrial solvent, and fixes heavy metals, including arsenic. Each of these metabolites can be traced to historical records of factories in operation at the site. This means that the present day living microbiome of the canal maintains a history of human intervention at the site, a molecular echo. Arguably, a more precise record than written histories, that is, if you know how to read it. It is precise from a more than human perspective, meaning that it highlights the components of the environment that are perceived by and meaningful to non-human organisms. As such, 
The present day microbial map of the canal defines a material record of human and non-human intervention at this site. Mm. What is made legible by this map is how the living component of the environment is being sculpted by the material properties of that environment mm. as it leaves distinct traces of accumulated metabolites, molecules that have been acted upon by living organisms. The metabolisms we see in the canal microbiome are proxy indicators for its abiotic material properties. And mapping these living populations is a form of material cartography. These maps tether the complex socioeconomic continuum of human health in the neighborhood with the geomaterial history of Gowanus. These maps not only function across geography and time, they provide insight from the smallest DNA molecules to far-reaching extraterrestrial human inhabitation. They map impacts of multinational corporations, deep ocean topographies, industries, and economies. They show us that materials are not fixed, rather in a constant state of transformation, of becoming inextricable from the living metabolisms they enact. So speaking a little bit more about metabolisms, uh, microbes respond to their environments through changes to their metabolism. Indeed, if the materials that comprise an environment include heavy metals, the microbe is pushed to evolve to withstand the metals. If the pH of the substrate is low, it will adjust to acidic environments. Measuring these properties provides a type of sensor for abiotic conditions. Documenting these metabolisms gives you a material metric, the metabolite, an artifact of metabolic, metabolic transformation. All multicellular organisms rely on symbiosis with microbes for essential functions of metabolism and defense. Microbial communities are the interlockers between multicellular organisms and their material environments. And any relation of humans to the material world is a relation to a metabolite and the microbes that processed it. This interdependence or relationality is the case from the scale of an individual microbe to a fish or a human. And very importantly for the work of this atlas is also at the telescoping scale extending from planetary assemblages to the economies and ecologies we inhabit. And so thinking about metabolite as a, as a material, what I offered in my chapter was kind of an interpretation of materials that had been discussed prior and how they could also be interpreted as um, being in the context of these assemblages and metabolisms. And so this part of the chapter is called the coda. These ontocartographic observations of the metabolic pathways of the microbiome allow us to see a model for material agency, one that works well beyond the existing anthropocentric paradigm. In looking closely at a specific series of metabolites, the metabolic relationships surrounding the other materials described in the previous chapters, then coming back to Gowanus, my goal is to show the agency they maintain in the given assemblage they are part of and how microbes tend to play along in that assemblage. Here we traverse scale, scales and orders of magnitude from the molecular to the cosmic through the monumental, communal, and highly personal. And so I wanted to read for you today um, just one of these coda sections, which is the coda section that corresponds to sand. The material of sand is a metabolite. Synthesized in a marine assemblage, it is fodder from the coral holobiont, eaten and excreted by the fish, and released as particles into the water. As sand, it accumulates on beaches and in deep sea reservoirs. This metabolite and the microbial symbionts of the corals are the key factors, key actors in replenishing the reservoirs of sand that are mined to nourish the depleted Florida beaches. The white sand found on Florida beaches and throughout the Caribbean originates from the surrounding coral barrier reefs. The coral skeleton, composed of calcium carbonate, like seashells and like the rammed earth described above, is broken down and eaten by fish, excreted, and eventually makes its way onto beaches and into underwater reservoirs. Coral is a holobiont, and it depends on its microbial symbionts for growth and photosynthesis. Sand comes from corals, and corals need microbes. Part of the sand depletion story is ocean acidification, which kills the coral symbionts and, in turn, kills the coral. This idea of the offshore sand reservoirs as depletable reserves of material is underpinned by an idea of reserve as locus rather than as an assemblage. 
Seeing the sand reservoir as a finite resource dissociates it from the coral ecosystem assemblage it is part of and introduces it into the engineering assemblage of the jetties and shoreline constructions. Here, the coral holobiont connects us to deep sea and deep time through its metabolites that feed the beaches of our leisure. Um, so here, coming back a little bit to the idea of metabolites in general. These metabolites of the Gowanus Canal and other environments outlined in this book give us a framework to define material agency in human systems as mediated by microbial metabolites, metabolisms. This microbial continuum fills the porous spaces between mater material and human, nature and culture at telescoping scales. All of these examples discussed illustrate the emergent agencies of materials in relationship with microbes. They arose, evolve, adapted without human input. But there are many intentional interfaces that people have designed to enact and harness these material agencies. Synthetic biologists dissect cellular processes and excise molecular mechanisms to use them as engineering tools and materials. Large-scale bioreactors are built to harness, like beasts of burden, metabolisms for fermentation or biosynthesis of materials. These apparatuses should actually not be an aspiration, but a cautionary tale. Though biological, these practices are as extractive as material mining operations. It is not for naught that microbes are cast as factories in the biotechnological discourse, yet offered as green or natural approaches to our need for material resources. The caution here is not the issue of scale, but the implicitly finite nature of this, ex of this extractive process. Here, Donna Haraway's ongoingness is a meaningful meter to assess these relationships. Can they be stewarded for five generations of communities of compost? So if we acknowledge that material agency in human ecologies, societies, and economies is mediated by microbial metabolisms, how can we embrace this agency of metabolites? Thank you.